Hi, welcome to lesson 2.5 in your inheritance unit, zooming into sickle cell. We're looking at a case study for Steve to determine if he has sickle cell disease. My name is Laura McGinty. I'm a high school biology teacher at Ballard, and I look forward to working with you through this, uh, through this worksheet. This particular video is designed to accompany that worksheet, uh, again, 2.5 zooming into sickle cell. It would help if you have it, it, uh, a hard copy of it or a digital copy, uh, as well as something to use to write with, a pen or a pencil, so that you can take notes as we go along. We're going to introduce the case of Steve, look at some of the test uh, results from those uh, tests, and then questions that we're going to explore to determine more of what's going on. As you're going through this video, pause it as often as you need to. Uh, we will have stop points to check, uh, to check the work and to give you time to answer the questions. Uh, again, we are going over some of these answers, so make sure that you're giving yourself time to answer them before we get into the explanation. Most importantly, though, remember to move at your own pace, the one that works best for you. Your personal health and well-being uh, supersedes or comes before all of this, so make sure that you're taking care of yourself and your family first. There are three goals with this particular video. When we're done with this, we should be able to answer these three questions. What is the genotype for the healthy blood cells versus sickled cells? How does the change in DNA affect the change in protein structure of hemoglobin proteins? And then how does the change in the hemoglobin protein affect the shape of the blood cell? So I wanna go over the worksheet that you have. You wanna make sure that this is the one that you have set up uh, and ready to go. Again, whether you have a hard copy uh, or a, um, a digital copy, this is the one that you're going to want uh, in front of you. Zooming into sickle cell, does Steve have sickle cell disease? You're going to have some background information here at the top. Uh, it's then going to ask you to sequence the, um, uh, the DNA. You have the healthy DNA and Steve's DNA. Uh, you have your series of questions about finding the differences between the DNA using the codon table to do the amino acid sequences, identifying differences and causes. When you move to the second page, you're gonna see that there's some more modeling here that talks about the hemoglobin itself, looking at uh, some comparisons between the different uh, structures of the hemoglobin uh, and how those structures impact the blood cell shape. Um, and then moving on, you have uh, this large table here, which then goes into the different alleles of hemoglobin uh, and uh, the impact of oxygen versus a lack of oxygen, healthy hemoglobin versus uh, sickle cell hemoglobin. And then questions eight is going to have you uh, explaining the phenotypes of each of those genotype possibilities. Nine is going to be a, a cell model. Uh, you've seen these before. You have your nucleus with the uh, allele coded uh, on them, and you're going to draw your protein, and then over here you're going to write the phenotype that exists. Uh, so basically a, a model of what you've written up here. And then your very last question, uh, identifying the genotype for an individual with sickle cell disease, and then using that information to predict the genotype of the parents to explain your prediction. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into this worksheet, starting at the top. We're looking at Steve's symptoms here. So Steve goes to the doctor, has a list of symptoms that he provides. Shortness of breath, dizziness, fatigue, or feeling tired all the time, headache, times of sudden pain, uh, times of sudden and intense pain, as well as a, a rapid heart rate and cold hands and feet. The doctor takes a blood sample and sends it to a lab, right? At the lab, the technician looks at the blood under the microscope and compares that sample to a healthy sample. And this is what we're going to see. On the left here, we have Steve's blood cells. On the right, we have healthy blood cells. You can pause the video here at this point if you want to take a closer look at the differences between these two. We can see pretty clearly here with Steve's blood cells that some of these are bent or crescent shaped. These are called sickled cells. So the doctor, after looking at the cellular scale, decides to do further testing at the molecular scale. Sickle cell disease is caused by changes in the DNA sequence that codes for hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is an oxygen transporting uh, protein that's found in red blood cells. 
When we see the results of Steve's DNA, we have to compare it to healthy DNA sequence for hemoglobin. Pause the video at this point to identify the difference between these two sequences, which lines up with question one on the worksheet. When we identify the difference, we can see it's this one nucleotide right here, this one nucleotide. Steve's sequence has the nucleotide T, whereas the healthy DNA uh, sequence has the letter A. So we need to look a little bit further to find out what's going on with the protein sequence or the amino acid sequence, and we're going to use the codon wheel to do that. The codon is a group of three nucleotides, as you recall. We're going to start with the very first one here, which is the ATG, and we're going to find the letter A in the innermost circle, move to the next circle in the next letter, which is the letter T, and then the third letter in the third circle, which is the letter G. So we have A, T, G. That aligns with the amino acid methionine, which is abbreviated M-E-T. So we would write that underneath the ATG codon. Use the codon wheel to code for the amino acid sequence for Steve's DNA, and then for the healthy sequence of DNA. Pause the video at this time to go ahead and complete those sequences. We'll do a confirmation or correction when you return. All right, let's check those sequences. You can look here and see in red or below the codons what the two sequences are for amino acids. You can see that they're fairly similar, so pause the video and see if you can identify the difference now that you've did a confirmation or correction for the amino acid sequence itself. Pause the video, identify the difference between the two amino acid sequences. What caused that difference? This lines up with questions three and four on your worksheet. If you've identified VAL and GLU as the two differences, you're correct. GTG is going to code for valine, so this is Steve's sequence and the GAG codon codes for glutamine or glutamic acid. Since it's a different sequence, it's going to code for a different amino acid. So Steve wants more research. He wants to understand better why his cells sickle when others don't. This is what he's found out. The hemoglobin protein found in those red blood cells is actually made of subunits, so smaller proteins that connect together to form the larger hemoglobin protein. The image below shows uh, what these hemoglobin subunits look like when they're carrying oxygen and when they're not carrying oxygen. You have the healthy hemoglobin subunit carrying oxygen and a healthy one without the oxygen. Then you have Steve's hemoglobin carrying oxygen and Steve's hemoglobin without the oxygen. We're now going to do a comparison between those. How do the hemoglobin protein structures compare? So comparing shapes one and three, which is healthy versus Steve's, so a healthy uh, protein versus Steve's hemoglobin protein, both when they're carrying oxygen. You'll then compare shapes one and two, which is a healthy hemoglobin carrying oxygen and not carrying oxygen. Lastly, we're going to answer the question here, which is explaining the difference between the protein shapes based on what we've learned uh, from our answers to the previous questions. So pause the video at this point and answer those questions. So here's our comparison of shapes one and three. You can see the healthy hemoglobin here is carrying, um, and you have Steve's hemoglobin here, uh, which is also carrying oxygen. But with Steve's, there's actually an extension that sticks out of the bottom that is not present in the healthy hemoglobin. And the next comparison that we were asked to do it was to compare hemoglobin, uh, the healthy hemoglobin, with and without oxygen. So for one and two, you can see that um, the one carrying the oxygen, there's no notch present, but the one that does not have oxygen, we have a notch in the shape of that particular protein. So how does this explain the difference in the protein shapes? Based on what we've learned about the DNA sequence changing, the amino acid sequence changing, and the protein shape being different. Ultimately, what we see is that the change in the code for uh, the amino acid 
changes the amino acid sequence, which then results in the different shape. In other words, we have different sets of instructions, which then produces a different product. We also need to look at the, um, how the shape compares uh, molecularly. So how does the sickle cell hemoglobin compare to a normal hemoglobin at the molecular scale? We know that the subunits connect together to form a complete molecule inside the blood cell, but how are they different? Pause the video at this point to answer question seven as you look at the image on the left here, or you can look at the same image that is found on your sheet. Again, as we take a closer look, we can see that in a normal healthy hemoglobin, they are connected and they form that square-shaped protein. Whereas in the sickle cell hemoglobin subunit, we can see that this uh, chain starts to form and it becomes, as it's seen here, long and inflexible. It's a rigid chain, which is what causes that uh, red blood cell to get that sickle shape, which you can see here in the uh, rendering or the drawing below. Steve does a little more research and finds out that everyone has two copies of the gene that codes for hemoglobin. These two alleles, or the gene versions, are A and S. A is for normal, healthy hemoglobin. The S is for the sickled cell hemoglobin. Sickle cell changes the amino acid sequence from glutamic acid, or the glutamine, uh, to valine. Valine is hydrophobic. Remember, hydro means water, phobic means fearing or hating. So water fearing, water hating, that means it just it wants to be away from the water. This results in a different shaped protein because the subunits are going to fit together differently in a way that they're going to try to hide that valine away from the water uh, as best as possible. So we're going to look at a chart to see what that looks like. You'll find this chart on your handout as well, but let's break down what all of this means. Looking across the top here, we can see hemoglobin A, HBA, hemoglobin S or HBS, and then something that has hemoglobin A and hemoglobin S. On this column here, we have an oxygen-rich environment, shape, and reasoning. So this is going to be the shape of the cell, the reasoning why that uh, cell is that shape. And then we have an oxygen-poor environment, uh, the shape, and then the reasoning, and then the predicted genotype at the base here. So we're going to do a comparison of the three of these. Looking for the phenotype, and remember phenotype means trait, right? So phenotype is trait, genotype is the genes. The genotype that we have here is AA, so two hemoglobin A's. In an oxygen-rich environment, you can see that the shape is round because they fit together within the circle without stacking. And then in a poor environment, oxygen-poor environment, we can see that it is also round because, again, the shapes, um, the subunits fit into the cell without having to stack. That means that this particular person has normal, healthy hemoglobin. The blood cell shape is round, so it does not sickle. Let's look at, though, the SS genotype. So the SS genotype, we can see here that we have the extensions pointing inward, uh, but there's not any stacking going on. So we do have a round shaped blood cell um, in an oxygen rich environment. However, in an oxygen poor environment, you can see that the shapes are starting to stack together because the valine, again, wants to hide away, needs to hide away from that water. Uh, so they stack and hide that internally, which means you're going to end up with this rigid, straight structure right here, which means that we're going to end up with a sickled cell. This individual then has sickle cell disease. The phenotype, or the trait, is sickle cell disease. The blood cells sickle when they're not carrying oxygen. The last one we're looking at here is the genotype AS. AS. So in an oxygen rich, again, they're going to fit in here uh, pretty nicely. Uh, you have a full round red blood cell. There's not any stacking or that long chain that occurs. However, in an oxygen poor environment, you can see that a chain is starting to develop. So there is a possibility, uh, because that valine is trying to be tucked away, um, there is a possibility that that red blood cell could sickle at some point in time. It could also be around. So we have a person here who has sickle cell trait. This is uh, sometimes the cell will create or become that sickle shape uh, when it 
the hemoglobin is not carrying the oxygen, so we don't have as much oxygen in our system. So this person is a carrier of the disease. So coming back and looking at the whole picture, for question nine, we're looking from DNA to protein to trait. So complete, you're going to complete the table to show the relationship between DNA, protein, and trait for individuals with genotypes AA, SS, and AS. Things to remember while you're doing this is if you're not drawing on the worksheet, you're going to want to include keys or labels for your drawings so that you can go back and identify easily what, uh, what you were modeling. And then also, as a reminder, phenotype is the trait, genotype is the gene. So pause the video at this point to complete your cell models for each genotype. So breaking this down, we're going to look at the three uh, that we have, genotype AA, the cell model that we have here. You can see that there are two normal uh, healthy hemoglobin proteins here. Uh, as, as coded for by uh, AA for allele 1 and allele 2. The phenotype is normal with no symptoms. For genotype AS, we can see that there is a code for a normal healthy protein and a sickled cell protein, which we see evidence of here in the cytoplasm of the cell. Here's the normal hemoglobin protein, the sickle cell hemoglobin protein, this particular person is going to be a carrier. Their symptoms are going to be uh, only during oxygen stress. And then we have genotype SS. This is a person who has genes for sickle cell hemoglobin protein A1, or allele 1 and allele 2. Gene, remember, allele means gene versions. The sickle cell hemoglobin protein is uh, present uh, here in the cytoplasm as well. The phenotype for this particular individual is going to be sickle cell disease. Now taking all of that information, it, we're going to now use it to be able to predict what the parents' genotypes could be. So as a reminder, recall what the genotype is for an individual who does have sickle cell disease. Use that information to identify what their parents' genotypes could be and explain your answer. Pause the video at this point and answer question 10. So to verify our predictions, a person with sickle cell disease would have the genotype SS. Their parents are going to have one of two possibilities here. Their parents are going to have SS and AS, or they're going to have AS and AS. Remember, each parent contributes one allele or one gene version to their offspring, we're going to learn more in that, uh, about that in Lesson 3. This brings us to the end of Lesson 2.5, zooming into sickle cell. Uh, we have three questions that we were going to answer by the end of this, so check your understanding to see where you are. Question 1, what is the genotype for healthy blood cells versus sickle cell disease? Question 2, how does the change in DNA affect the change in protein structure of hemoglobin proteins? Question three, how does the change in the hemoglobin protein affect the shape of the blood cell? Your steps after this are to move on to 2.6 model revision tool. And this is to review your initial idea that you completed in 1.1, that inheritance initial model worksheet. And you're gonna make edits based on what you've figured out so far. Then you're going to complete a row on your learning tracking tool titled 2.5, Zooming into Sickle Cell. Thank you so much for all of your hard work, and we really appreciate your time and energy.